Symptom management. All right, so there's probably going to be a lot of questions, and I'll try to go through this kind of fast. And thankfully, Augusta has already kind of done a nice job introducing a lot of what I'm going to be kind of talking about and actually using a lot of the same analogies. So hopefully, I'll extend that a little bit. So <clears throat> location, 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 as Augusto was trying to say, and why people sometimes have different types of symptoms associated with their MS, right? And Augusto had brought it up, and I'll blame him, why there might be differences between men and women. <laughs> Just saying. All right, so the, the brain does have certain parts that do certain things, and so location does reflect when you, uh, what kind of symptoms you will have. Um, and so there are certain things that are very important to the brain, so about 40% of the brain is involved in vision. Um, so brain, eyeballs sit up here, and signals have to make it all the way back, and you can see there's a fair chunk of the brain that's involved in sort of processing visual information. Strength and numbness, things that we tend to think about as very, very important actually to the brain, not so important. You kind of see that as far as primary function, that they're pretty much localized in here, and not much part of the brain is involved with it. We tend to think a lot as humans, sometimes. Um, and so a lot of that sometimes can reside up here. Uh, hearing is over here. And so you kind of get a picture as to all the areas. And of course, then you got to connect everything. So this is kind of a similar picture to what Augusto had shown. And this, you know, a lesion sometimes in one area can affect things in other areas, and that's because there's a lot of fibers that need to be connecting parts of the brain. And if you catch one of those fibers, which is where MS tends to go at mostly, um, when we talk about white matter disease, that's again all the connections between the brain, and so that's the parts that get affected. Oh, wrong way. Yes, we like maps. So, um, um, <coughs> I didn't think about it as an interstate system. If you want to think about a city, that's fine. But basically, everything has to be connected. And it's how do you get from one point to the other. Sometimes you have big lesions. Um, sometimes you tend to have small lesions. And it's just depending on how you kind of get from one area to the other. So symptoms depend, again, um, we talk about symptoms and we talk about signs. So sign is what we measure as docs. You know, if I'm checking how strong you are and you're not very strong, that's a sign. But if you tell me that you're weak, it's a symptom. So not much difference there. But again, location, size, and number. Um, and how much damage there's to a lesion. So a little pothole, you can drive over it. A big pothole, maybe you get stuck. And sometimes if you're going fast enough, you can drive over it. And if you're driving kind of slow, maybe you get stuck through it. And so that's sometimes when you can feel well at some times, and sometimes you get stuck when you're getting tired and things like that. And Augusto has already covered that many um, lesions don't necessarily have to give you symptoms. And that's why a lot of times in our first MRI, we send a lot of spots that maybe you never had symptoms with, and maybe you did, and it's completely unrelated. Um, so there's a huge disconnect between what an MRI looks like and what patients look like. So we talk about MS relapses, MS symptoms, and pseudo-exacerbations, and of course we can't even agree on names. So MS relapses, we'll call flare-ups, flare attacks, exacerbations. This is trying to get at that, le that concept that you have a new lesion. So you have a new lesion that's causing new symptoms or it worsens something that you had. Sometimes that's very clear. All of a sudden, your right leg goes completely weak. Sometimes it becomes a little bit harder if it's just a little bit weaker and it's a bad day versus a good day. Is that a new relapse? Is that just kind of old symptoms kind of coming back if you're having a urinary tract infection? If it's a hot day outside, you just got taken a hot shower or something like that. So sometimes, again, very easy to tell the difference. Sometimes not so much. And that's part of the reason why we rely on MRIs so much. Pseudo exacerbations are particularly in those those instances where you have a relapse, but maybe it wasn't. It's symptoms that you had in the past, and it's exactly that. It's that concept of maybe you took, it was a hot day outside, you wore yourself out a little bit too much. It's not necessarily a new lesion, but you just, the signals aren't getting from point A to point B. So I'll use a Gustos analogy. Basically, if you're trying to get from one point to the other, you only have 10 bucks to get there. Nowadays, maybe it gets you there. But when gas was five bucks a gallon, maybe if you have to start rerouting all over the place, you can't quite make it all the way there. So lesions sometimes are well marked, sometimes a little bit harder to see. So just kind of stressing this importance that you know some days 
signals will make it through a nerve and sometimes they just won't quite get there. So for relapses, and then I'll stop about relapses, basically these are kind of symptoms that we tend to see when, we, when we're looking for and trying to fish out for something that's a, that's a relapse. Weakness, vision problems, things with numbness, it can be tingling, vision problems, again, more double vision versus loss of vision with, with, with the optic neuritis, dizziness, which is kind of a broad term that we use for lightheadedness or vertigo sometimes, which is room spinning. And that's why we ask so many different weird questions trying to get at specifics. Because to us, we're trying to separate things and put things into little camps to kind of help sort things out a little bit. Bladder issues are common. And then a lot of other things that you know might be tremors or other, other ways that we feel the world, such as vibration, knowing that if I close my eyes, my hand is still up here. Sometimes I can lose that, and that's called proprioception, um, and things like that. So why do we care about symptom therapy? Mostly because once you have the lesions, we don't have ways to repair it. So we got to try and figure out ways to try and help your quality of life. That sometimes means therapies that are targeted for MS symptoms, but the reality is we end up using a lot of medicines that are used for other fields that we think will help hopefully with you, and sometimes it's a trial and error type of a process. The sign to treat is an important aspect. If you have a little bit of pain, the, con the side effects of a medicine that's going to make you sleepy may not be worth taking a medicine for it. And so that's kind of part of the discussion with your doc as far as trying to figure out when to treat when to push up the dose, when to change treatment, um, because ultimately what you're really trying to do is limit side effects and still find a way to improve your quality of life. So how much time do I have left? <laughs> so these are all the things that, you know, common symptoms um, and things that we can try to sort out. And so a lot of times this is why in the doctor's visits we ask specifically that, you know, maybe try and find the, the top one or two things that are on your list for us to discuss because we're trying to kind of get so much information, trying to figure out if it's a new relapse, trying to figure out if these are just symptoms from old lesions. Um, and do I need to treat you with steroids or just simply kind of try and get some of the symptoms improved so that your quality of better life can be improved. A lot of these things feed into each other. So this isn't so easy a lot of times as just saying, oh, you're a little bit, um, you know, my mood's not great or I'm tired or something like these. These things feed into each other. So, you know, for example, finding out that, you know, you're tired can be either that you're depressed or it can mean that you just were up all night for the last three days because you had a lot of pain. And so a lot of this is trying to figure out ways, you know, and, and the underlying root cause as to what the problems are so that we can try to actually fix what the problem is. So when you look at MS symptom management, <laughs> again, it's trying to figure these things out. A lot of times this is just says patient education. Really our visit a lot of times is about doctor education and trying to figure out, you know, really what, where those symptoms are coming from. Um, it's important to kind of evaluate physical activity. We talked about exercise with Augusta earlier, and I think that that's very important. It's involving specialists. You know, there's people out there, I have to admit every once in a while they're smarter than me. Um, and so trying to get them involved. So if it's a problem with the bladder, you know, I can maybe start and I feel comfortable using one or two medicines, but if that's not cutting it, then sometimes it's involved getting a urologist involved. And so this is kind of where this team approach and trying to get a lot of people around you that are um, hopefully very smart as well to try and sort of tackle, you know, different aspects in different ways to again improve that quality of life. And then ultimately prescription medicines um, if there's something that might be helpful in that way, or sometimes um, not necessarily prescriptions, but if there are different techniques that we can kind of do or equipment, um, depending on what the problem is. All right, audience participation. <laughs> What's the most common MS symptom? For me, walking. Walking. Fatigue. Fatigue. All right, we got a winner. So. Um, <laughs> Walking is very common, and, and a lot of the things I'll be talking about are very common. I'll try and hit down the most common ones, but fatigue is probably one of the most common ones um, that we uh, try to help out with. So this is a subjective lack of physical or mental energy. So a lot of times, you know, the patients will come in and say, I'm weak, and I test them, and they're strong. And I go, well, you don't seem to be that weak. And it's like, well, 
why don't you test me after I've walked a couple blocks or if it's 100 degrees outside, right? So, so that's kind of a little bit of what's difficult for this um, and evaluating somebody sort of in a brief period of time. And a lot of times what we try to encourage to have either a friend or family or relative um, that can come in to help provide some of the history. Um, and as we'll get into with some of the cognitive things and things like this, given that that's also a very prevalent symptom, you know, sometimes the information that we need is not going to be provided by the patient, but somebody around them. So over three quarters of patients will have fatigue. A lot of times fatigue, when you start looking back when we're diagnosing somebody who's been there for a, for, a, um, for a long time, you know, it gets kind of hard to say when, when did my MS start? Hard to say, right? Um, and 40% of patients will say that that's their worst symptom. So why name it? So these are all the things that we're trying to kind of figure it out. You know, is it the damage to the nervous system itself? Was it just because you're trying to expend more energy? Instead of going that nice direct route of sending signals through where you want them to, are you having to go around a long way to get those signals through? Are you just out of shape? You know, If you compare me to Arnold Schwarzenegger, man, <laughs> I don't stand a chance. Um, sleeping problems. If you're sleeping, if you're not sleeping at night, you're going to be fatigued. And if you're not sleeping because of pain, Sleeping medicine, hopefully, you know, may help you sleep through some of that stuff, but it might be having to address some of the pain symptoms. And so that's kind of where that chain of, of symptoms kind of feed into each other. Uh, pain, mood disorders, medication, infections, again, are very important to kind of evaluate. One of the biggest things and one of the biggest challenges for, for us is, you know, we always love to prescribe medicines, right? Um, I do it. Um, problem with fatigue is that almost all the medicines I prescribe will cause fatigue. So it's a huge issue when patients come in and they say, I'm on a muscle relaxer and I'm taking opiates for my pain and I'm taking sleepers because I don't sleep and they're waking up with fatigue because the medicine lasts longer than what it normally would, would have. And so trying to kind of go through a medicine list and say, hey, maybe a Maybe the right strategy is to not give you so much pain medicine at night, or maybe we can get away with a little bit less pain medicine or something like that. And so trying to kind of clean up the medicine list um, could sometimes be a huge thing, or maybe trying to switch from one category of medicine to another to try and help eliminate some of the side effects that are associated with our medicines. Um, interference, for example, even the medicines that we use to try anterior MS are, can be associated with a lot of fatigue, and some people won't have issues, but some people will. Um, and so it's trying to figure that out. Um, alcohol, caffeine, smoking, you know, taking out the wrong time, all these things can be bad. You know, if you're taking caffeine at night, you're up all night, the following day you're probably going to need even more caffeine to kind of jumpstart your day. Um, illicit drugs, so when you crash from cocaine or amphetamines, it's not good. Marijuana is just going to increase your level of fatigue. Um, so it's kind of knowing, you know, and getting to know you as a person and knowing, you know, what medicines you're taking. So again, the things that we need to look at as far as managing fatigue are to rule out and treat other sources of fatigue, you know, the medicines, things like this. We might be able to use prescription medicines. A lot of things are behavioral type things. Can we get you to walk better? Can we get you to do things a little bit better so you expend less energy as your day goes by? Um, also energy conservation, cooling techniques. If you're somebody who's particularly sensitive to, heat, uh, to cold, maybe trying to avoid that. Uh, or, or sensitive to heat and trying to keep you cool. I'll talk a little bit about bladder. Bladder is a very complicated system. Um, seems easy until you have somebody who's a six month old and you're trying to potty train them, right? Um, unfortunately, with MS, it's kind of the same thing. So when you look at the chart, basically, um, just to kind of emphasize, you need to be able, when you're trying to pee, the bladder itself has to squeeze. And it's at the same time, you have to open up the valve down here to let the urine out. Any problem with either of those two systems makes it hard to pee. There's a lot of parts of the brain that are involved in this. There's parts in the brain up here that help control sort of you, when you want to control it. For me right now, it would be a bad time to have to go to pee. Um, but if I can push it another 20 minutes, I might be better off, right? Um, so this would have to be able to kind of coordinate that. 
And then those signals have to make it all the way down to the bottom of the spinal cord where more of the centers are um, that actually control all these muscles. So there's a long way for things to be affected to cause MS or to cause bladder issues. Um, overactive bladder basically, um, and I'm going to skip a little bit of this, but basically just emphasizing that there's many things. So a lot of things that we can do are either working on the exercises, avoiding caffeine, limiting fluids, but not too much. We want you drinking lots of fluids still because we don't want to hurt the kidneys in the process. Okay? There's medicines. We might need to do catheters just depending on what the problem is. And again, finding that smarter person that might be able to help us out. So referral to urology sometimes. Bowel symptoms, unfortunately, very common. Constipation is a huge issue. A lot of times fairly mild, but nobody really likes to talk about peeing and pooping when they see their doctor. So we don't get to hear about it very often, but it's something that sometimes can be useful to have as a discussion. Um, diarrhea can happen, but usually it tends to be a little bit more on the constipation side just from experience. So things that we can kind of try to do are exercises to kind of help things flow a little bit better. Um, and all the other stuff that everybody's already told you. Drinking lots of fluids so that you can form um, a better stool, adding bulk formers, maybe even more diet. Sometimes it's a little bit of stool softeners or other medicines that might help. Emotional changes in MS, again, something that we're getting better, I think, at trying to address and that people are opening up a little bit more so about. But I couldn't imagine being an MS doc about 50 years ago when nobody really talked about mood and trying to try and address some of the other issues, right? And so depression is a huge issue that you know just needs to be, to be addressed and affects so many other things in, in our lives, right? Uh, it affects how we sleep. It can affect how we sense pain, how well we deal with pain, um, how well we interact with others, how happy we are, how motivated we are to go and do things. And so if we can help with uh, depression particularly, we can really have a big impact on our patients' lives. We have a lot of great medicines, um, and so it's important to kind of discuss these things. There's a lot of things that can kind of affect it. So not only do you have a disease that's you know, causing damage to the brain, um, but there's also the challenges about living, you know, having to use a cane, a wheelchair, a walker, um, limiting how much we can get around and interact with other people and things like that. And then again, our disease-modifying treatments. Interferons, for example, can have a you know, big effect on depression in some people. So again, it takes a lot of different pieces to the puzzle to try and figure out how to manage depression. Um, medicines are part of it. That's kind of what I'm, parts of the things that I'm good at. Sometimes it's you know, referring out to people that can prescribe bigger and stronger medicines. It's, talk therapy, so getting you to a good counselor or a therapist. If, if it's depression because of grief or other things like that, you know, it's trying to identify what those other sources might be. Um, physical activities is what the white thing that nobody can read, um, but it's the yellow piece there, so you know, it's trying to get you to be a little bit more active and things like that. Pain. So the thing that most docs will try and run away from, we're trying to create a specialty to kind of send everybody to. Um, but there's a lot of things that we can sometimes try to do, and we get really good with certain symptoms about MS, for which sometimes we have fairly decent treatments for, um, that can make a huge effect. So for 10 to 20 percent of our patients, it's a huge issue. One of the things we'll be talking a little bit about is for related conditions. In our NMO patients, pain becomes a huge factor because the spinal cord has a lot of signals that regulate pain that go through it. But if it's something like a trigeminal neuralgia, excruciating pain in the jaw that shoots out to the front of your uh, jaw, if that's the case, sometimes that takes, you know, again, a team approach to try and figure out what that is. Uh, Lermite sign, that tingling sensation that some people describe when they bend their neck forward. Um, so if that's the symptom, sometimes. You know, it doesn't require medicine, but some people, man, every time they're trying to look around, you see them walking around stiff, because any time they move their head, it just makes their symptoms worse. Low back pain and things like this, is it because your MS caused a little bit of imbalance in your hips and you're walking, you know, favoring one leg, and so all of a sudden your spine's trying to balance things out on one leg more than on two legs, and so if it's an MS issue or if it's a 
orth, uh, orthopedic issue. So trying to identify that working with physical therapists is a huge factor. Cognitive issues, kind of the same thing and a little bit of that cognitive reserve uh, conversation that um, I think might be coming later. Um, so it's a huge issue. And the problem is that cognitive stuff is one of the major issues why people stop working. You know, somebody's in a wheelchair, their legs are weak, but their mind still works. There's a lot of stuff that they can still do for a living. But if the memory's not there, it gets really hard to do that. And there's a lot of ways that sometimes we can work on this. Again, not great, but if it's retraining and job or things like this, if it's because it's fatigue or depression causing a pseudo-dementia um, and complicating issues, then it's something that we can, again, work with. Tightness. Um, Again, whether we use medicines or can use, um, this is an intrathecal pump uh, for baclofen, so you know, getting a little bit more specialized about the medicines that we deliver and how we deliver them. Mobility is a huge issue, and again, many things that kind of go into it. It takes, you know, one of the common phrases that we use is that walking is kind of like a constant state of falling, where we're just trying to prevent ourselves from falling as we take each step, right? So not only do you have to be strong, but you have to be able to feel where your feet are. You have to be able to coordinate all that. And if you're tired and fatigable or you have pain, it just affects all of that. So sometimes it's using braces. Sometimes it's a cane, walker, or wheelchair. And the one thing I'll mention is Ampera. So Ampera is the, the, the walking medicine. Um, and I think it's a pretty useful uh, medicine. It's just got approved in 2010, so it's fairly new to our use. It is associated with, with a risk of seizures. But here, we talked about demyelination. You can see the myelin in uh, red overlying the nerve in green. And as it gets peeled off, that area just is not going to be very good, particularly there. It's not going to be very good at sending signals. If the nerve is cut, we can't do anything to kind of, at this point, to get signals across. But hopefully with Ampera, sometimes we can get signals across these areas where that insulation to the wires has been destroyed. And there's a lot of other things that we can address and kind of talk about. So the biggest thing about summary you know, for symptoms is to address them with your doctor so that you can start having a conversation and help you deal with them. And my biggest recommendation is to try and pick one or two things so that you can actually have a meaningful discussion about them and actually sort of start working on things because usually you're going to be touching on many different things as you discuss that one or two issues. Sometimes it's referring to specialists, sometimes it's working on medicines, and sometimes it's just you know, trying to change behavior a little bit to try and help uh, symptoms get better.